So good morning, everyone. We are the Wheels team, and today we're going to be talking to you about the Wheels Project. Before we get started, I just want to reference this picture. Wheels doesn't have anything to do with water or the ocean or the beach or anything like that. We chose this picture because we felt that it symbolized the open doors, the opportunities, the possibilities that we feel that Wheels provides to those our research effects and to us, the researchers. And um, as students, we've seen how WHEELS has impacted our lives as students. It's opened doors for us to change the lives of individuals around the world and to travel and to publish papers. And many college students don't have the chance to be able to do that. And so we feel um, that WHEELS has been able to do that for us. And this picture represents the open doors of that. Um, now I'd like to introduce the team to you. My name is Karen Ngulu, and I am currently serving as the team lead for this semester's research project. The members I serve with this semester are John Francesco. Emily Simonitis, and the senior members of the WHEELS team are Austin McCaslin, Melanie Dittmer, Emily Tett, and Luke Funk. Mrs. Rispin is our faculty lead and advisor. She began the WHEELS project back in 2010, and each year she organizes research projects for us and oversees all of the work that we do throughout the semester. The mission of WHEELS is to enable individuals and children around the world with disabilities have more functional lives in their wheelchairs and assistive devices such as prosthetics, orthotics, and braces. So even though an individual um, in a third world country, even though they might have a wheelchair or an assistive device of any sort, if it's not working, then it's kind of like they don't really have one because it's not actually doing its job. As WHEELS, we like to utilize user feedback in order to give these users of wheelchairs and assistive devices a voice to be able to effectively communicate to wheelchair specialists and manufacturers what is wrong with their wheelchairs and what can be fixed. We work to assess and address those problems. And so more about WHEELS. As I mentioned, we want to enable individuals with disabilities to live lives more functionally. We are a group of student researchers comprised of students just like you guys. We come from all different class levels and we have different majors. For example, I'm in my second semester of WHEELS and I am currently a sophomore biology major. And when I began as a freshman last year, we had a senior engineering student with us. And so it doesn't really matter what major you're in or what your class level is, you can still contribute to WHEELS if you're interested in it and if you have a heart for WHEELS. Students also take WHEELS over the course of two semesters. So in between those semesters or after those two semesters, we travel to Kenya and we partner with a school in Pika, Kenya called Joy Town. And while students are there, they have the opportunity to perform research with the students at the school and to meet a handful of individuals that are research impacts. And Luke was able to travel to Kenya, and so he's going to come talk to you about research that he was able to do while he was there. So. Hello, so my name is Luke Funk, like Karen said, and I am a senior um, studying biomedical engineering. And I've worked with WHEELS since my sophomore year. I did a couple of years, well, one semester and then a summer in Kenya. And then I've been working from various other things since then. Um, I'm going to talk to you first about um, the main project I worked on and then how we took that to Kenya and how we did that there. So this is what we call a lower limb function questionnaire, or an LLFQ. You're going to hear that a lot today, so remember that acronym, LLFQ, is a lower limb function questionnaire. What that is is an outcome measure of functional ability. So basically, uh, it's 20 items, um, different aspects of gait, how people walk, how people feel while they're walking, how stable they feel while they're walking, and those sorts of things. And they're going to rate um, how they feel about those things on what we call this vast rating scale. So there's um, just a simple line, um, they just mark on it um, how they feel. So the right side is going to be like they feel great about it, and the left side they don't feel as good. And then we have some little grade markers in between to kind of show um, some different levels of in between where would that would that would fall. Um, so this um, the LFQ is used for a variety of different things um, potentially. This was developed by Mrs. Rispin, some um, researchers she collaborates in Canada, and the idea is that it can provide feedback on rehabilitation and assistive devices. And so a lot of times um, people that wear orthotics or prosthetics living in the developing world don't necessarily have the right resources to be able to um, do really um, really advanced tests on how well their brace is working or how well they're walking. And so this could potentially work to assess those things quantitatively and also get their personal feedback of how they feel about how they're walking and how their assistive device um, is working for them. And so it could potentially help identify some potential um, strengths and weaknesses in their gait or, or their assistive device and also help to plan their rehabilitation and figure out ways, that, um, things that can be targeted to be able to improve their walking and their gait. 
Um, so and it was designed to be able to be appropriate for a number of different conditions, cultures, and ages. So um, most recently been working with it with people that have orthotics and prosthetics, but potentially it could be used people that don't have assistive devices, um, and also in different cultures, like for example, we took this to Kenya, but it could be used in the U.S. or other places, and also a variety of ages. And this is kind of the format um, it looks like. There's a bunch of instructions and stuff at the top, and then um, 20 questions that look like this with different things. And if you want to see the whole thing, you can download it actually at letu.edu slash LLFQ. So in the summer of 2014, um, a variety of us went to Kenya, and I was in part of in charge of the part of the study um, dealing with LLFQ. And so this questionnaire is recently developed, and we want um, for clinicians to be able to use it to be able to assess their patients. Um, but before they do that, we have to prove that it's actually a good questionnaire and that it's reliable. Um, so that we call that process validation. There's different types of validation for a questionnaire to be able to prove that it's useful and reliable. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is test-retest validation. And basically what that tests is if you um, use a, the questionnaire on a person at one point in time, and then um, sometime later you'll get um, re consistent results both times. And so the way we test that is we had 39 participants um, take the LLFQ twice with a six-day period in between them. So the idea was they'd kind of forget what they had answered the first time, and they'd test them again, and hopefully... Um, they answered similarly both times. So we had a big classroom full of students, 39 students, at Joytown in Kenya, which you'll hear more about throughout the presentation. Um, but it was a little bit like crowd control at some points, but we got everyone to finish their LFQ um, twice, which is a really great uh, achievement um, by itself. And then we were able to compare each student, their first score to their second score, um, and see how close those were to each other. And we use a statistic called the intraclass correlation coefficient, or ICC. And the higher, the better. And so we were shooting for an ICC of 0.8. And you can see we were really close. We had a 0.79. Um, and if you look in the literature, actually, a lot of people say it's acceptable as long as it's over 0.7. So um, we are pretty happy with that. But we have a few ideas of why it wasn't quite as good or um, how it could be improved. So this is what we call the LFQ clumping problem. Um, and so, like I had mentioned before, there are these grade markers um, beneath the line, but you're not actually, the participants aren't actually supposed to select the specific grade. It's supposed to help them, um, guide them to be able to, to give a more accurate um, grade. And so, unfortunately, we wanted them to mark anywhere along, even between the letters, and a lot of them chose to mark directly above the letters. You can see this is a dot plot. Each one represents a single participant, so a lot of them selected right at D or right at C or right at A, and so that kind of um, skewed the data a little bit and didn't give a full range of what people could answer, um, and so that we think that uh, skewed our uh, reliability results some, and one way we're potentially going to improve that in the future is to change the instructions a little bit so it's more clear that the participants can mark anywhere along the line and not just around those grade letters. So that's kind of an ongoing study there. We also did something called construct validation, which um, shows that the questions themselves in the questionnaire is accurately measuring what it says it's measuring. And the way we do that is we take some tests that are already um, proven to be accurate, and we um, compare those results to how uh, participants answer the LLFQ. And so some tests that we did, which, again, you're going to hear more about some of these later, um, but we had a what we call a six-minute timed walk test. And so the participant will just walk on flat, level ground for six minutes, and they'll wear the FitNet unit, which you'll hear a lot about. But it basically measures oxygen consumption and how much energy someone's using while they're walking. Um, and then we also did the FitMate as well on an obstacle course. And so this obstacle course included a short ramp, um, some stools, as you can see, that they kind of weaved in between, and also some stairs that they had to walk up and back down. And those kind of simulated some of the things that are in the LLFQ, some specific questions that asked about um, stairs, or asked about walking in between tight spaces. So we can um, directly compare the obstacle course results, how long it took them to, or how far they got in six minutes, and also how much oxygen they consumed to how they answered on the LLFQ. We also had them complete um, gate right analysis, which is a variety of different um, gate parameters, including step time, stride length, um, and different things like that, which again, you're going to hear more about that um, coming up. And here are some of um, a summary of our results, I guess you could say. Um, so you could see um, some of the things, um, p-values show significance of these 
results. So anything below 0.01 we said was significant. And the first one we see here, obstacle course distance traveled. So that's how far a participant got in that six minutes they were doing the obstacle course. And we um, correlated that to the LFQ results. And so if someone said they walked very well on the LFQ, um, we saw they should be able to walk farther in that six minutes on the obstacle course, which came out to be true with an R value of 0.62. So the best R value possible is one, but no one really ever gets to one. So 0.62 is pretty good. And um, interestingly enough, the oxygen consumption was not significant for the obstacle course. And we'll leave that was because when participants felt like it was hard to walk on the stairs or something like that, instead of working harder, they just slowed down. And so that was kind of um, one thing we saw there. And we also had a bunch of our gait um, characteristics that came up significant, including velocity, so how fast people were walking on the gait right mat, um, along with um, stride length. So that's um, from like right foot back to the right foot, how long that whole stride is which is known to be representative of how confident someone is while walking or how, how um, balanced they are while they're walking. Um, so that's kind of a summary um, of the results there. And I actually was able to submit a journal article, which is still under review right now. We're waiting to hear back from the reviewers. But I was able to submit that, and we're waiting to hear back. And then if it's published, that'll help um, clinicians be able to actually use this questionnaire in the clinics, be able to assess their patients and how well their assistive device is working and or or the real rehabilitation. So as you can see, Wheels has been a great experience for me and for everyone. And let's see, who's next? I actually don't even know. Emily's going to talk next about what they're doing this semester. All right. So I'm Emily Simonitis, and I'm a sophomore biology student. And this is my first semester of Wheels. And this semester, we have continued studies with the lower limb function questionnaire. Um, however, we have had a um, smaller range of participants. So we were able to test different brace conditions against each other using our participants. So we, this semester we had a total of 30 participants. Each participant wore a leg brace um, at, a, at 10 degrees, 0 degrees, and um, unlocked or full swinging. And um, immediately after 24 hours of wearing the brace, they would fill out the LLFQ. Um, they also uh, performed gait right, fit me, and times up and goes, which you'll hear about later um, with these braces. So this is just participants taking the LFQ. Um, so this semester we've been testing for sensitivity validation, which means can the LLFQ tell between the different brace conditions. If it can, for questions dealing with um, the sound of the brace and things like that, that shouldn't really change because we're using the same brace for each participant in each condition, um, the data throughout should be quite similar. However, for questions like going upstairs or um, the participant's gait, it should be different because if you can imagine, going upstairs with a straight leg compared to a bent leg is much harder. So this is our results so far for this study. Um, as, so the higher the score, the better, they, the better that brace condition did. So as you can see, the unlocked scored significantly higher on many categories compared to the bent or straight brace. This is up close to a few of them. So as you can see, sound is more consistent throughout, whereas comfort and um, awkwardness in walking are, the unlocked is significantly higher than the other brace conditions. Um, this is the mean of our LLFQ answers overall, and um, there is, you can see a slight difference between the straight and the bent, but there's an even larger difference between the straight and the unlocked, which is what we're looking for. We haven't been able to perform a ton of calculations yet, so we don't have exact numbers, but um, so far the data is promising. <coughs> and John will now talk to you about construct validity of the LLFQ. Okay, so my name is John DeFrancesco. I am a sophomore biology major as well. Uh, this is my first semester as a part of the WHEELS team. Um, and I was in charge of the FitMate portion of the study. Um, so just an overview of what the FitMate is. Um, the FitMate is comprised of three parts. So there's the, the mask that the participant wears. There's the computer that um, all the data is sent to. And then there's a connection between the two. It just transfers all the data to the computer so that we can do um, the analysis and we can put it into Excel. Um, 
So the FitMate system, the big thing that we're looking for um, is, like Emily was saying, the construct validity. Um, so that's just how the data moves and if it moves in a consistent way with the LLFQ data. So this is a um, quantitative study that we're doing so that we can um, just see the difference and see, make sure that it's, um, it's being validated or the LLFQ is being validated. Um, so the VO2 measurement, a little bit more about it. It's the amount of oxygen that a participant um, consumes during the course of one minute of the study. So we do the study for um, an extended period of time for six minutes, um, but the, the units are just the milliliters per minute um, of the oxygen being consumed by the participant. Um, so this, the, the overall VO2 um, is just a, a large number, but then we um, divide the overall number by the the kilograms of the participant, so the, the weight of the participant, to find a sort of normalized um, VO2 for the participant so that we're able to then compare um, between participants instead of having larger variation, there's a smaller variation between the participants. Um, so in the, um, the, the VO2 also is a, a proven measure of um, validation, and it's something that's been proven, so we're able to use that to validate the um, the LLFQ. Um, okay, but a little bit more about the, the testing that we did. Um, we measured VO2 consumption. So what we first did was we would have them wear the, the FitMate unit, so they would put it over their mouth and nose, and they would just sit comfortably for four minutes, um, just comfortably breathing normally, um, not exerting themselves too much. Um, and we would measure that and then after that, we would have them go um, to a treadmill, and we would have them walk for six minutes um, wearing the FitMate again with the three different brace conditions. Um, and so the, the, the benefit of the treadmill was that it was a consistent pace. It was something that they were constantly doing so they wouldn't slow down if it got too hard or speed up, uh, but they were walking at a consistent pace, which helped um, the VO2 measurement be more consistent. Um, and then after we got the three different brace types, um, the data for those, we would put those into the computer, um, and we're currently just organizing those right now, and then we're going to perform some, um, some tests on those later to get some of the, the stuff that Luke was talking about, some of the more um, solid data, I guess. Um, the the six-minute test um, for the, the data that we would take from that was just the last four minutes of the test, um, because the first two minutes were kind of the... Um, the warm-up stage, so after the first two minutes we would take the then the last four minutes of the test and we would be able to um, see more of a constant um, amount of VO2 rather than like the, the sharp incline. Um, it would more level off after that. Um, so the data that we have right now for it, um, as you can see the VO2 for the straight brace condition and the VO2 for the bent brace condition are pretty much the same. Um, but as you can see, the, the unlocked VO2 is significantly lower, like two, two points lower. So that's two milliliters um, per minute lower than what it would normally be. Um, so that's promising. Um, and that's good. And um, we're going to have Austin talk a little bit more about another way that we are validating the LFQ. Oh, my little brace tried to run away. Uh, so this is an example uh, of the brace that we had our participants wear uh, during the course of this study. Um, so my part of the study was to run the gate ride mat. Uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, uh, I served on wheels prior uh, to this semester. I've served two uh, with Luke and Melanie, and uh, we went to Kenya together, and now I'm actually working for wheels this semester. My portion of the study was to run what we call a gate ride mat. A uh, gate ride mat is basically just a portable mat, it's 16 feet long, and it has little pressure sensors throughout the mat that uh, track where various objects are being placed on the mat. Um, so, excuse me, um, it measures temporal and spatial analysis, and uh, temporal meaning time, spatial being spatial things like distance. And so, uh, like I said, it's pressure-activated sensors. Uh, it's capable for participants of all ages. And um, but obviously, during our study, like we mentioned, uh, we had all college-age students. Uh, that way, we had a consistent um, population, or excuse me, sample size. Um, 
It's also bipedal and quadrupedal compatible. You just have to set that before you actually start the test. So, say if somebody was working with uh, someone who had a cane or a walker or something like that, you could actually say, okay, this person has a cane, has a walker, that way the gate right mat, whenever it does its analysis, it's like, whoa, you said it has two feet, but there's like three feet going on here. What's going on? Um, so that's one way to, uh, to figure that out. Um, so this is some of the things over here on the left side of the screen that you see, some of the parameters that the gate ride will measure. Um, one I find particularly interesting is the toe in and out, uh, just because it's not so explanatory. That basically it is the angle between um, your direction of progression and the midline of the foot. So say I was walking straight towards the stairs, if I had a very large angle of toe out, I'd be walking like this, basically like serious duck feet. Uh, if I was more like toe in, I'd be pigeon toed, and that would be a larger toe in angle. Um, and then one of the cool ones I think about the oh excuse me about the uh, temporal um, measures is the heel, midfoot, and toe percent temporal values, and that's basically just the amount of time we're spending on each part of the foot. Um, so that's kind of interesting because that's not really something you can look and see. Uh, it's much easier whenever it's quantified uh, through numbers. So this is an example of uh, the post-test screen that we would be looking at. Uh, it's the screen where we do some of our analysis, um, I guess our, our first analysis. Uh, as you can see, the left and right feet are different colors. Uh, the left is going to be more of like a teal and um, the right more of a magenta. Um, yeah, it's straight out of Crayola, so y'all appreciate that. Um, the best way I can think to explain of how it looks whenever people are actually stepping on it is if you've ever walked on sand before, uh, it's kind of the same way. Whenever you're walking on sand, it leaves a gradual footprint as you progress through your footstep, and then whenever you're done, you can look back and see more of an indention in an actual footprint. This is actually a lot more um, specialized and exact than, uh, than sand, but... Uh, that's the best example I can give you. So, like we mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking at three different brace angles. We're looking at straight, bent, and unlocked, or swinging brace. Uh, swinging is just, there's no, it's not like keeping your leg anything. All it's doing is basically keeping your leg from going in and out. Um, so, what we're seeing is it's very consistent, though the numbers are not the same for all three but we're seeing that the brace leg, which is our right leg, is consistently taking less time with step. Uh, so step is basically, um, so if I take step here, once this foot leaves the ground, how long is it taking to get back around and make contact again with the ground? Uh, so that's what we're seeing. So basically, whether that be the person swinging the right leg or, uh, or whatever that may be, we're seeing consistent uh, that they are spending more time on their right leg rather than their left leg. Uh, so why are we using the gate right mat? Why is it important? Uh, as Luke and John put so eloquently earlier, we're looking for quantitative data to support what the LLFQ is telling us through qualitative data. Uh, it's hard to put numbers to that all the time, uh, to people's opinions. Uh, the LLFQ does a good job of that, but this is another measure in, the, in addition to the Fitmate that we're using to say, okay, if they're saying it's easier to walk, are they, you know, does the data show that uh, through the Fitmate and through the gate ride? Um, and it's just another way to show construct validity, um, again, as Luke and John mentioned. And so now I'm going to pass it off to, I believe, Karen, and she's going to tell you about uh, the last portion of our study. So unlike the Fitme and gate rate test, the time up and go test was actually the simplest test. And it was an assessment of mobility, which is basically one's ability to move. And we were looking to see how easy it was for them to stand from a chair and sit back down in a chair. And so the participant would walk three meters away from the chair and walk back again. So the exact instructions we would give to the participant were, when I say go, I want you to stand up from the chair, walk to the line on the floor at your normal pace, turn, walk back to the chair at your normal pace, and sit back down again. And so this is a demonstration of a participant actually doing that. The results from the test are as follows. This shows the time it took for the participant to travel, um, or to perform the tag test at the different angles. 
The straight and bent um, angles didn't show significant difference in the time it took for them to perform the test. However, there was a significant difference between the straight bent and the full swing um, angles. And so from this, we can see that the less time it took for the participant to perform the tug test, um, it was probably easier for them to perform or to move around um, and sit in the chair and stand up from the chair. And so we can conclude that the more flexibility the participant had in their angle and the ability to move their, their knee, the easier it was for them to move and to stand up from the chair and to um, sit back down in the chair. And so this was our study from this semester. And Melly is going to talk to you about a study she was involved in last semester. Hey, guys. So my name is Melanie, and I've been a part of WHEELS. I'm a senior biology major this year, and I've been a part of WHEELS since my sophomore year. I was able to serve as part of the team for a semester, team lead for a semester, and then I went to Kenya the following summer with some of these guys. And um, then I've been working on papers and attending conferences, paper or singular, um, since then. So it's been awesome. I've been able to be involved with WHEELS in a lot of different ways. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, one of the cool things about WHEELS is that you do get a lot of opportunities besides just the on-campus testing procedures that um, everybody's been talking about so far. Um, and one of them was the ISS conference. I was able to go this previous February with a couple different members of the WHEELS team. Um, and ISS is a pretty typical conference except for that it's basically for anybody and everybody who has anything to do with wheelchair seating and mobility. They're the ones that come to this conference. They attend, um, and we were able to go. There were over 1,800 people there um, while we were there. And just like most conferences, it consists of two basic sections. And um, one is the session section, and the other is an exhibit hall. And um, so over the course of the three-day conference, um, there were 140 sessions. Um, you can see the list up there, pre-symposium workshops, plenary sessions, papers, posters, demonstrations, all sorts of different things. Um, so if you've done any research with anything to do with wheelchairs or you have anything to say about it, you can present or submit an abstract and um, be considered for a presentation. And then the other part is an exhibit hall. There's an 85,000 square foot exhibit hall. So basically just a huge room with a whole bunch of different um, people showing off what they created in the world of wheelchair technology. So this is anything from power chairs to different types of honeycomb seating that helps avoid pressure ulcers and um, anything like that, um, anything you can imagine. So um, very cool opportunity. While we were there, we got to do several different things. Um, it was in Nashville, Tennessee, so we got to do a little bit of sightseeing. There's um, some of the girls who went on the trip. And um, we also got to wander around the exhibit hall. Um, this guy we're talking to in the second picture is actually an alumni of Laterno. And he designed this power chair. So we were able to talk to him and even take it for a spin for a little bit, try not to break it, which was fun. Um, and then I also got to present. So one of those 150 paper sessions, or 140 paper sessions I was talking about, one of those was mine. Um, Mr. Oh. Spin and I submitted an abstract, and I was able to um, present to the people who attended my session. And then the, the session was about um, a study that we'd actually done a few years back on campus with some wheelchairs. Um, and I was comparing two different wheelchairs produced by two different companies. So very cool opportunity for me to practice presenting and um, just that whole thing. And then um, the CEOs of the two companies whose chairs I was talking on were actually there. So that was really cool and kind of stressful because I was saying, hey, your chair is better than his chair. And here's some bad things about both your chairs that you need to fix. So <laughs> trying to say that in a very delicate way and offer advice and feedback. And they were very receptive to it and very respectful. It's totally a positive experience. So and a very cool thing for me, just for experience for my resume, for all that stuff. So, so we did all that, um, but we also had maybe what you'd call an ulterior motive while we were there, and this is actually what we spent most of our time doing. Um, and you've heard a lot about validating questionnaires. You're going to hear more about that. It's not the LLFQ, though. We were working on validating a questionnaire called the Wheelchair Components Questionnaire for Condition. We call it the WCQC. So basically, what this is looking at is not the design of a chair, but its condition. Is it broken? Is it torn? Is there rust? Are there missing components? Are there broken components? This question asks that. So it goes through each of the different parts of a wheelchair. This example question asks you to rate the seat. And the person who rated it said the cushion was worn, the covering material is thin, has holes. Um, so it goes through all the different, goes through the seat, the handles, the wheels, the casters, et cetera, et cetera, and throughout the entire wheelchair. Um, and so we were doing test retest validation, just like you've heard so much about. Um, but we actually did it with the professionals who were attending the conference. So all the people that came um, to showcase their products and to look at other people's products, um, we actually stopped those who were interested in wheelchair or who were interested in wheelchair professionals um, and asked them to take the test once and then come back 24 hours later. It was a three-day conference. Um, take it again. 
And so you can see over here on the right, um, Sonia teaching, telling two different professionals how to use it. And there's another guy uh, who's manipulating the wheelchair, trying to see all the different parts. Um, so yeah, so like I said, we're looking at um, test tree test validation, and that was able to show us several different areas um, in which we could prove that the WCQC does what it says it does. Um, the first one was intra-rater reliability. So that has to do within one single person. So basically, the theory we worked off for that was one person's opinion on a certain wheelchair probably isn't going to change within a 24-hour period, but if this test shows that it changed, then the pro that probably means there's something wrong with the test. So we looked at the take one to the take two of each individual person and calculated ICC values, just like Luke was talking about earlier, and we got an ICC value of 0.893, which is really strong. Like he said, greater than 0.7 is usually the bare minimum, so we were happy about that. So it shows that they're similar from the take one to the take two, and then we also looked at inter-rater reliability for each chair that was looking at. So we had two chairs, the quickie and the tri -light. So for everybody that looked at the quickie and did the WCQC based on the quickie, we compared their answers, and they were very similar. And then we compared everybody who rated the tri -light, and all their answers were similar. So that's inter-rater reliability, and both of those were over, this one's over, they were both around 0.9, actually, which is really good, really strong. And then we also looked at sensitivity. So. Um, they gave an example of sensitivity for telling the different brace conditions. So this is telling, asking sort of the same thing. Can the questionnaire differentiate between the quickie and the tri -light between the two different chairs? They're not the same chair. They're not at the same condition. And this questionnaire was able to tell us that. We got p-values of less than 0.001 on a scale of 0 to 1, which is, which is pretty good. So all our values verified what we were doing, which was trying to prove the WCQC does what it says it does. But why were we doing that? We believe that this questionnaire is of key importance, especially to people who are given wheelchairs in less resource settings like Kenya, which is where we go most often. And this is because in places like Kenya, you're not going to have the ability to replace wheelchair parts like you can here in America. It's not as easy to fix things or replace them, um, make them better. So if someone is making a wheelchair to send overseas or to send to this area of even our country that's um, less resourced in this way, it's really important that the wheelchair parts be able to last for an extended period of time for as long as possible. Because if they're broken, like Karen said, it's as if they're not, a lot of times it's as if they don't even have them at all. So using this questionnaire, we can determine, okay, we have this wheelchair, it's been in use for this period of time, which components break first? Do any of them break quickly? Do they take a while to break? And then we can give that information to the manufacturers and say, hey, this component gets broken really easily, so you need to come up with a better design to make it last longer. And, um, like, and Emily's going to talk about this too, we've already had some very positive results um, in terms of uh, manufacturers have come back to us and said, hey, we've heard, your, heard what you're saying and we're actually fixing our wheelchairs because of it. So that's a super cool thing. Um, so all of this data I'm working on writing up in a paper right now. We're still in the process of writing and reviewing, uh, Mr. Spin and I are. Um, we're hoping to get that finished by the end of the semester and hopefully published. So another awesome opportunity um, through wheels that I've been able to do. And now Emily's going to come up and talk about more awesome opportunities. So I'm Emily Tutt. Uh, I'm a senior biology major, and I was involved in Wheels uh, my freshman semester. And I went uh, traveled to Kenya in the summer of 2013, and I've pretty much kind of been involved in different ways ever since, different writing um, opportunities. And I was able to go back this summer, summer of 2015, and do some more research. Um, so yeah, Wheels definitely uh, attempts to meet a global need um, in wheelchair provision. There's a lot of people that need wheelchairs, um, but a lot of people try to send um, wheelchairs to meet that need. But as you can see by this picture from Joytown, this is kind of their, the wheelchairs that don't work pile. Um, and so we want to see less of this happening and more um, sending people wheelchairs that actually work and actually don't end up in a big pile like that. Uh, so one way we do that is by, you know, asking clinicians uh, what breaks first on a wheelchair. Another really important way is asking the users what works um, well for a certain chair. So this is really needed. Um, for the research field, there's not a lot of literature on, uh, from the user's perspective, um, and it's also needed in industry to help produce uh, wheelchairs that are better, they're going to last longer, and they actually work functionally for someone that has the need for one. Um, so this leads <coughs> to development of things like um, the WCQU, and this one is the same questionnaire, essentially, or similar questionnaire to Melanie's. It's a wheelchair components questionnaire, but this is for the users. So instead of looking at the condition of a wheelchair, what's broken, we're looking at components of a wheelchair, like here we're looking at the seat, but we're asking the user to rate how the seat works for them. Does it 
is it cushion enough? Is the cushion enough? Um, is it does it make you sore? How is it working for you? Um, so again, uh, we developed or this questionnaire was developed, and then we're looking to do test retest validation, like you've heard before. Um, and we actually took it to Kenya this summer, and so we did uh, test retest validation with Kenyan users, um, and we got to go back to Joytown, and we got a big room of students, kind of like in in Luke's study. Um, we asked them to take the WCQ once, and then a couple days later we came back and asked them to take it again. And we're going to compare those take one and take two answers. Um, so this is a big table of some of the stats that we did, that we got. We um, wrestled with all the data, and this is some of our um, ICC values. And so down here uh, on this side of the column we have um, the different questions, the different components, the seat, the frame. Uh, these are the number of people that uh, responded to that certain part. And then um, these are the ICC values. And we were shooting for things around 0.8. Anything above 0.7 uh, was, is pretty acceptable for the literature. And we, it, we felt it was stronger to go question by question and see uh, which ones um, were uh, reliable, which questions reli were reliable. Because as you can see down here, there are some things in this questionnaire um, that are pretty specific to um, a certain user's wheelchair. Not every user needs a belt or a harness or a headrest. Um, and so there were less people that were able to fulfill this part of the questionnaire because they just didn't have that part on their wheelchair. So some things that have really low numbers, we weren't able, there wasn't really enough statistical power to um, get good ICC values. Um, so like Melanie, I'm actually working with Ms. Rispin right now to write up all of this into a journal article and um, put this out there into the, the literature so other people who need to do um, some kind of, want to get some kind of feedback from users on how their chair is working for them, we can say, hey, we used this questionnaire and we got this kind of result, so maybe you can use this. Uh, for your needs, um, and so it's pretty cool to be able to contribute to this research community that you've been working in and reading about. Um, so that's been really neat, um, investing in these kind of patient-reported outcome measures. Um, but my favorite part of Wheels um, has definitely been the people. Um, so my experience at Joytown is always my favorite every time. Um, me and Danielle Thiessen, this another student who's been on the Wheels project, um, we got to go back, and both of us had been to Kenya before. So we got to see some of the same kids and actually see, you know, they were a couple classes ahead. So it was neat to see who had moved on. And um, it's a boarding school of elementary and high school kids. So they all have dreams and plans and everyone, like, is really focused and knows, like, oh, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a doctor. And so um, it's cool to kind of catch up with them and just sit around and, and have fun and catch up with the staff. Um, we have a pretty cool relationship with them. So this is Ms. Ruthman playing board game with some of the therapists. Um, so that's been, it's really cool um, to talk with them. And another really cool thing that we got to do this summer um, is we got to build a bunch of wheelchairs. Um, so this was a really neat example. Uh, we got to show the kids that we're working with. We have these kids. We come every year and do all these tests and questionnaires, and we have them do all these things. And what's the point? And this is a really clear way to show them um, that from some of the data that we had done in the past, uh, we had told this company, Free Wheelchair Mission, that their casters kept breaking in a certain way. So Free Wheelchair Mission, um, they <laughs> took all these comments and the the things that we had found about this chair. They redesigned the casters, and then they sent out a new batch of wheelchairs to Joytown. Um, so we put them together to show the kids and brought them to meetings and showed the kids, hey, you guys helped us figure out what was breaking. This company responded, and they sent you brand new wheelchairs. And it, like the people that had these chairs that were broken, you're going to get a new one. Um, so it was a cool way to show these kids that all these things that they're doing, they actually have a voice, and they have power to, to change things. So that was pretty cool. And I felt pretty proud to come from an engineering school and put together wheelchairs, even though I'm a biologist. <laughs> um, the other cool thing um, that Wheels is definitely all about um, impacting uh, the community and outcomes, but it's also about the connections you make and um, expanding opportunities for both the wheelchair users and personally as researchers. Uh, for me, while I was in Kenya, um, I got to extend my time there, and the week after I did research, I got to do a week of medical shadowing at um, a hospital in a, a nearby town. Um, so I, I did a week of surgical observation with a pediatric surgeon. So I. This was my view every morning at 7.30 as I waited for the doctor to, to come grab me and I rushed around him all day to his meetings and uh, surgeries and things like that. Um, I had time to talk with doctors and surgeons from all different fields. Danielle and I both got this opportunity and um, we basically had, uh, by the time we got to know all the doctors and nurses, we had free range of that OR to, to look at the board and see what surgeries we want to see. Um, and the doctors actually stopped surgeries to, to let us come in closer and see certain parts of it. And that was a really unique opportunity. Um, this is, was another part of my view. Um, as a, a pre-med student, this is not something you would get to see in the States, um, rarely, as just, I'm, no, I'm not a med student yet. I'm you know, no one in the medical world, but I got to see this. I got to see really detailed parts. I got to actually scrub in and help in an operation. 
which was a really awesome experience for me. Um, so I guess my conclusion, big takeaway, is, is Wheels really gives you so much. It really attempts to give people so much and the outcomes measures we're trying to bring. And personally, as researchers, um, there's just so many opportunities that um, it can bring up. You never know what it could be. And even for Melanie, she's more, um, she wants to do veterinary stuff. One time when she went, or a couple, last summer, a couple summers ago when she went, she got to extend her time in Kenya and she worked um, at a, um, uh, the Masai Mara and studied big cats and, and tracked leopards and all this stuff. Um, and that was just kind of, Wheels helped her get there and do that, what she wanted to do. <coughs> so if you're at all interested in Wheels, I'm going to pass it off to, to Karen, but there's lots of opportunities um, in Wheels. So if any of you guys are interested in Wheels or if you feel touched by the mission of what we're doing, um, we invite you guys to apply. You can talk to Mrs. Erskine in her office. Um, this is her email address, and you can email her for an application. But we'd like to thank you guys for listening to us today. And if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So. Okay, questions for our speakers today? Anyone? That's maybe more the frontier wheel. We're more testing wheelchairs that have already been designed. Yeah, they're really cool. We don't make them ourselves. <laughs> What's the average price range for your wheelchairs for the uh, community you're trying to reach? I should, What's the kind I should of bracket you want to keep it in? Um, the free wheelchair mission donates chairs, like it's in the name, so it really depends on the company that produces them. Um, from there, I'd say between free and two hundred, free and hundred and fifty dollars. Anybody ask price questions? It's got layers. First, how much did it take to put together? How much did the parts cost? How much did the labor cost? And then the shipping, shipping is a huge deal. But even in North America, people don't pay for wheelchairs. Insurance pays for it. And overseas, there has to be a grant or a donation or something. So that's kind of a layered question. Um, but typically, the wheelchair companies that we have studied cost between 150 and 300 or 350, they say. Mm -hmm. Now, how they figure that cost is a different question. Mm -hmm. And Cindy, like, that's always the battle, the struggle for a wheelchair manufacturer, especially if you're trying to target people that need wheelchairs, is you want to make something that's good and functional, but you're trying to control the costs for people that you know, can't really you're trying to donate a, a large amount of wheelchairs that are quality wheelchairs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a struggle. The free wheelchair mission company that I was talking about, their first wheelchair that they made was literally a lawn chair on wheels. Like it was just your basic run-of-the-mill lawn chair and they put wheels on it. So I mean their idea was to try to make it as cheap as possible, but then you run into a lot of problems with clinical, like a lot of clinical problems with a wheelchair that's that basic. And so yeah, like Emily said, it's just this really give and take of best design and most cost efficiency. So another way wheels can help that is like people, you know, they really want to donate to this need, so they make they cheap chairs, they donate, you know, oh, I had this hospital folding chair that I used in my surgery, now I don't need it, so I'll donate it to Kenya, people don't need it. Uh, so we try to provide data that says like, yeah, that's useful, but really, if, you know, just for this extra money that you can invest in a better wheelchair that's going to last longer and really improve someone's condition rather than worsening a clinical condition. So we try to kind of help motivate um, donators and suppliers to, to invest in that, that more high-quality design. Uh, mentioned the clumping problem that came up on the LLFQ, and the same sort of spectrum with the label was on a couple of the other surveys also. I don't want to oversimplify the problem, but would you get rid of clumping by just getting rid of the letters and not necessarily changing the instructions? Uh, potentially, yeah. Um, the one thing with the letters is it helps a lot with the, the pediatric population that we work with, and sometimes we don't understand the scale of, like, a, there's a smiley face and a frowny face, but what's all the stuff in between? So it kind of helps put it in perspective, especially for um, for school-age kids, yeah. So, and actually, we've, we've changed, so a lot of our questionnaires have that same format, and we've changed the instructions on a couple of them. We've already seen that problem go away, so... The uh, grade underneath is also helpful because it's one thing to say your wheelchair 
had a mean of something or other from the visual analog scale, and or if you say your wheelchair's foot plate's got a C, mm -hmm. that's a lot more powerful and motivating change. <laughs> the biggest way that I guess we partner, which um, with, it, Will's all about his connections and who you know, and Mr. Swift's really great at knowing a bunch of people, um, but like all the wheelchairs that end up at Joytown are uh, connections with certain manufacturers and we say, hey, we'll study your chair if you donate so many wheelchairs to this school. Um, so it's all just kind of a, um, yeah, just a connection that the wheelchair companies donate things and uh, Mr. Swift knows about which companies are um, kind of either want to be studied and responsive to being studied or I guess kind of like really popular the, um, the the buzz in that in that world of uh, less resource wheelchair provision. Do you have more to add about how you connect? With I also check with the clinicians at Joytown to see what they feel they do, um, and then we invite someone from that wheelchair company to be there to when the wheelchairs are fitted to make sure they're happy with how they've been handled, and also we invite someone to come and actually see what happens at the study so they're not hearing. They were participating while the results were being taken, so they feel more involved in what we were doing and understand what we were doing and actually saw it with their own eyes. So we've gotten to travel with some fun people that way. Because the people that do this internationally are amazing people. The people that make the wheelchairs and send them and come up with funding and all. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have one last question if we can. Okay, if the tug test was a practice just to get the hang of surveys, that would make sense, but um, the difference in the average times for the get up and go was a fifth, like from so the two that were next to each other, but it was only a fifth of a second. How much of oh, go ahead. Go ahead. How much of a difference can that effectively be when using a brake? Okay, well that was why we added the third brake thing with the fifteen because the three and the bent were only ten degrees of difference, and so we could argue that that probably wouldn't give us a significant difference because the way that you can move your knee with the bent and the straight were pretty similar. The testing and the fatigue don't probably show that, and it did. The, the times that they didn't do that were similar. But with this looking, you can see how the difference in the time was significantly lower, and so that showed us that it was much easier to move. Now, and whether they're statistically different, we won't know that until we actually run the analysis, and okay. I think they haven't quite finished the data set. Um, I think you have three more people or something. I don't know if you have them all for the tug yet, but we have to put it into SPSS and actually run the NOVA to see whether they're different statistically. So we don't know yet. Okay. Well, the, the, the thing that was curious to me was that it was seven. It was like 7.97, 7.98 something. And then for the full swing, it was 7.7. .7. So we'll have to run statistical yeah. analysis and see. The timed up and go is one of those validated tests that's been around for years. Okay. And it was actually there in Luke's test as well. Um, and uh, Luke's study, we weren't able to really look for sensitivity because everybody was wildly different from each other. You know that every disabled person is different. But uh, with university students with brace, they're more uniform, and we should be able to look for similarities across different studies. So that's why the time is in there. So, I think it's about time for us to get up and go. And before we do, let's thank our speaker.